Hello. So this video is for project 2A, the mine escape, and I'll grant you that what I wrote in the slide is a little redundant since it's in the uh, margin, I guess that would be below me. Um, but I had to write that in there so I could write something else down below it in the slide that I didn't want to take the time to write the whole thing while we were talking. So the project one, I want to give you a little bit of uh, apology first. Because we did project one letterman, and because we only gave you a a project that needed a 1D vector, we wanted to make a project 2 that would give you exposure to a two-dimensional vector. We don't want you to uh, finish 281 without ever using a two-dimensional vector. So there are other different versions of project 2, and the downside to this version of project 2, the part A mine escape, is that it's a little bit too similar to project 1. But there's still a lot of useful things that we're going to learn in here, uh, using priority queues and statistics and a running median and all kinds of things. So, when you look at the project spec for part A, we're doing an escape from a mine where there's piles of rubble. And we have dynamite that we are going to use to blow up that rubble. Now, um, what we want to do is blow up the smallest piles of rubble first, and that determines a priority order, etc. But let's talk about things that are going to come before that, like reading in this 2D vector. Oh, wait a minute, creating a 2D vector. Well, there's actually in the STL, there's no such thing as a two-dimensional vector. What it really is, is a vector that contains another vector that contains some type. Okay, that's really weird. My pencil was like lagging behind my writing, so it was really hard to see. Let me just erase that so we can actually. Okay, so if I declare that object, and then let's say, and I started to write this down below, Let's say I had to do things in here, like read the size. And then I want to resize it after it's been created uh, as an empty 2D vector, and then I want to read in the size. Then what I would do here is I could say, hey, I want to take my map 2D object, resize it with some number of rows and some number of columns. Now, in our particular uh, project 2 part A here, our size is always going to be, there's always going to be one size. So the number of rows and the number of columns is always going to be equal. But in some other implementation, we might have one where it was like a rectangle with 10 rows and 20 columns. So if you look in the uh, lecture, let me see, I think it's lecture 7. Yes, yeah, so if you look in the lecture seven slides and search for the word streamlined. And I picked that word because it's unique. It only appears on that one slide. You'll see at the very bottom of that slide, something like this, except it's only one line. It assumes you know the number of rows and number of columns before you create the vector. So what we want to do is here, we want to use this bottom one that we can create it as an empty one, read the size in later, and then resize that vector to be exactly the right size. Now, this order here of rows and columns is very important. Now, granted, in our Project 2 Part A, this will be the size of the, of the mine. But what's critical is when you look at Map 2D, so I'm like, I'm somewhere in a for loop, or it may not even be inside of a for loop. It might be in some other code. But if I want to look at map 2D, square brackets, I've got to go row number, square brackets, column number. So that's how I will get to a particular thing within the 2D vector. Now, what's going to go in our 2D vector? Well, we're going to have a structure. It's going to have to record the what we read from the file, the rubble amount. And this is a place where, again, it's a little bit too much like Project 1. we got to have a, uh, some way to, to tell if this 
uh, location has ever been discovered. And like I said, a little bit too similar to Project One in a few respects, but lots and lots of cool stuff in here. So that's what's going to go in our 2D vector. Now, later on, we're going to have to also create a priority queue. And when we create a priority queue, we're going to have to have a different type. So we're going to have one type, and that's kind of like Project One. We had one type that went in our vector, different part type went in our deck. Well, here we're going to have the same thing. We're going to have one type goes into our 2D vector and another type goes into our priority queue. Now, in the priority queue, it says in the project spec that we have to take things out in a certain order, like, like I said, the lowest amount of rubble first. And so you've got to have in what goes into the priority queue, what goes in there has got to have the amount of rubble and the row number and the column number because these are how you break ties. If I had two different tiles of like 20 rubble, which one do I break first? The rules tell you how to break the ties using row and column numbers. And this makes it unique. So even if we have a tie on rubble and I think the next tie breaker is row number, if we had a tie on rubble and a tie on row number, the column number would have to be different. So we'll always be able to make a distinction of which one should be the highest priority. Now, one of the things you're going to have to overcome in part A here is you still, in part A, we still want to resist the urge to use pointers. Don't use pointers in part A. Over in part B, the pairing PQ, you are going to have more pointers than you would like to have in the pairing PQ. So we don't want to use pointers in part A. If we use pointers in part A, we're going to have to add more data to other things and we're going to go way over on memory. So we don't want to use pointers in part A. What you're going to have to have is you're going to have to have a bunch of different structures. You're going to have to have a structure for what goes in the 2D vector, a structure for what goes into the priority queue. You're going to have to have a, a structure that's a funk door. You're going to have to have a funk door to be a helper to the priority queue so that when it's got two things in the priority queue, it can say, um, I don't know which one of these should be the highest or lowest priority. I call my helper and the funk door tells me true or false. So when you write your funk door, so whatever type, and I'm just going to call this, so if I've got a priority queue, whoops, Q, U, E, U, E, a priority queue of, I don't want to say type because we did that, you know, let's call this PQ type. You can come up with a better name for it either. Uh, and let's call this the primary PQ. We're going to come back to why it's the primary in a few minutes. So if I've got this thing, I can't just give it the priority queue type because, or sorry, the PQ type because I've got to have more than that. This won't work because the priority queue doesn't know, this type it doesn't know how to make a decision is A less than B. So what we need is instead we need, for instance, take a little bit of room, priority underscore Q of whatever our PQ type is, comma, vector of PQ type, comma, let's call it a PQ functor. That, and that's our primary PQ. Okay, now here's where Something is, uh, I think the STL people made a stupid choice. So in the middle here, so we're saying this is the struct that I want to put in the priority queue. And this over here is a struct also that overloads operator parentheses. So it's got to overload operator parentheses. Now this middle thing is always going to be vector of whatever that is goes here. It's, we're always going to say 
some it, we're either going to be making like a priority queue of integers and we're just going to let the normal normal ordering of integers happen or if we're going to put a type here that's our own type we've got to say our type comma vector of our type comma functor that helps the priority queue make a decision this is i think where the stl people made a stupid decision I think they should have reversed the order of the second and third parameters so that I could not have to say vector of the first thing. But we got to live with it. So, so when we create a priority queue, we're either just going to have one type like int and the, the ordering of integers will take care of itself, or we're going to have three types inside of the priority underscore queue. Okay, so that's going to be our functor that accepts. What's the functor going to accept? It's going to accept two things of this type. So in operator parentheses, it's going to ac ac accept two things of that type. Oh wait, two things of that type pass by const reference, and it's going to answer the question. So if this was, I'm going to have to change it a little bit here. Okay, so if this was operator parentheses of like um, a comma b, and here we're into the sort of pseudocode range, because I, I didn't have room for the types there. This functor must answer the question, is the priority of A less than the priority of B? And that's what you've got to make happen in your functor. In part A, think of it as we've got the external view of a priority queue. I don't care how behind the scenes the priority queue makes the highest thing come out um, when I say top and how it gets rid of the highest thing when I say pop, I just have to make it happen. And to make it happen, I've got to write a functor that does this. And then the priority queue will make sure everything happens properly. So if I put in a couple of tiles and I've got like the, the priority queue is saying, okay, I've got to look at these two. Uh, I've got a rubble of 20 and a rubble of 10. If it gave your functor a thing with 20 rubble and a thing with 10 rubble, your functor would say, okay, I've got to say, is the priority of the one with 20 less than the priority of the one with 10? Yes, it is. So it should say true in that case because the higher rubble has a lower priority. So whenever you get into project two and functors, this is true for part A or part B, and you're wondering which way should that functor go, write down an example before you write the code. It'll make it a lot easier. But all the functors in project two, either part A or part B, always have to answer that question. If the parameters are A comma B, it has to answer the question, is the priority of A less than the priority of B? If the priority of A is less than, you say true, else you say uh, false. And this is where you go in and break the ties. If it was 20 rubble and 20 rubble, uh, I don't know. I've got to look at the rows and columns to make my decision. Okay, so that's the priority queue's got to be able to make those decisions with the functor to help it. Now, another thing we have to do, like I said, is we've got to make sure that given locations never get discovered twice, and that's in the primary PQ, which I referred to right here. And we're going to come back to that primary PQ in just a second. So the primary PQ is used for discovering locations within the mine. However, if you take something out of the primary PQ and you go, ooh, that's a TNT. If it's TNT, what you need to do is you need to start a second PQ. You need a second priority queue, which is only going to see the stuff that's blown up by the TNT. So really think of it like I'm going to need a doubly nested loop. I'm going to have to have an outer loop on the primary PQ. And if I take the next thing out of the primary PQ and it's TNT, I've got to have add it to the TNT PQ. And then I've got to have a while loop for the TNT PQ. And there's going to be some interaction there. I'm not going to give away everything here. But one thing I can say is the example at the beginning of the project spec, which is, I'm just looking up here, 
uh, page four to five, yeah, page four to five. So the example that's in there, is what I used to write a solution to this project. Like I read the other stuff, but that example was what made my code work. And every time I went, oh man, there's that's that can't work that way. I'd look back at the example and realize, oh no, I don't quite understand this right. And what had happened was we had an earlier version of this that had some different things. Like the TNT didn't exist, but you had a limited amount of dynamite and you had to say like where you escaped from the mine and we got rid of the limited supply and where you escaped and we added the TNT and my staff made this example and I went to write the solution and I was like oh this just this example doesn't work and oh yes it does I just didn't understand it quite right so this example is really really good at helping you clarify that understanding of what does it mean? How does the TNT interact with the normal clearing of stuff, etc.? So you're going to have to look at that example and look at the what happens and look at like later on. Um, there's other examples with a different input with verbose output, and so that's one of the things you want to do when you work on this project. Um, work on the verbose mode as you go. Because if all you have is that summary line of, like, I escaped uh, after clearing three tiles and 20 rubble, and you go, those aren't the right totals, you don't know anything about how it went wrong. But verbose mode would help you get it right. So make sure you work on verbose mode as you go. You can add the statistics and median mode at the end. You can go back, create some data structures, add some code that says, if median mode is on, do this. If statistic mode is on, do that, and you'll just add some if statements in there. Now remember, when you're writing the, it initially with verbose mode, the verbose output is still going to have to go inside of an if. If verbose mode is on, see out this stuff. But make sure that uh, you write the verbose mode as you're going, just enclose it in an if statement. But then you can come back later on, add the code for median, add the code for statistics one at a time. Now, when you do the median and statistics, you're going to feel like, oh my gosh, I've got these containers that are keeping track of this data for median and statistics. And well, wait a minute, I don't want those containers to exist if the mode's not on. Don't worry about it. As long as it's an empty container, I don't care about that amount of memory. That's like 24 bytes. Who cares? So the having um, some data that you use for statistics, having that variable exist if statistics is off is fine. Just make sure that you only fill that container if statistics is on. And you've got some kind of container for median mode. If median mode is off, the container exists, it's empty, it's a few bytes, who cares? But if median mode is on, you're going to actually put data into it. Make sure, if you found this video, you probably know there's a video about median mode look at the video for median mode and it might I think I made it pretty generic because our median mode is used for all kinds of different project twos. Um, let's see so an overall approach to doing this project okay so let's let's just make an outline here outline first part's going to be understanding I'm going to understand the mine escape And I'm going to start understanding the pairing heap, which we're going to implement as pairing PQ. So let's start understanding that. Then when we start coding, let's start with the simple stuff. In part A, let's start off with the command line. Reading the input. which involves our 2D vector. And then on part B, let's start working on sorted PQ. 
to, to do sorted PQ, we're going to have to under uh, we're going to have to add something to the understanding. Sorted PQ, you're going to have to look at unordered PQ.h. Look at unordered PQ.h. It's got some stuff in there that's going to help you with the sorted PQ. And watch my Part B video. The Part B video talks more about the uh, some things that are important to you for getting started on the sorted PQ. And then we can start working on, let's code some more complicated stuff. Let's start worrying about part A's PQ. Oh, let's start out with the primary key P, the primary PQ. And then we can add the TNT PQ later on. Let's start working on the binary PQ of part B. And this whole time, you should be understanding pairing heap coming to office hours, asking questions about pairing heap. Come to the office hours, and I should have put this in the Part B video. Come to the office hours and the one-on-many and ask questions about like the pairing PQ. We'll be happy to go through examples and uh, draw out stuff. Now, the good news is you have everything right now you have everything you need for part A, the sorted PQ, and the binary PQ. You have all the tools you need to do those. You haven't maybe used priority underscore Q yet for part A, but it's pretty simple. You create one, you push stuff, you look at the top, you pop stuff off. Kind of like part A, or sorry, kind of like project one. So you have everything you need to do part A, sorted PQ and binary PQ, and you're going to have to do some reading and thinking for the pairing PQ, and you're going to have to do some thinking about like how you'll make all the stuff in part A work.